Welcome to our third episode of our Music Education in Action series, where we are exploring music technology in teaching and learning contexts as they might occur in a remote online teaching modality. My name is Dr. Jennifer Lang, and I'm an assistant professor of choral music education uh, in the Department of Music at the University of Saskatchewan. And I am joined today by Wayne Giesbrecht. And Wayne, I'll just let you introduce yourself and what you do uh, at the university and maybe some of the projects that you have been working on, um, uh, which will explain why we are so lucky to have you <laughs> as, our, um, as our speaker throughout this series. Oh, sure. So I, uh, my official title is a Senior Media Developer, and I'm not the Senior Media Developer, but I am a Senior Media Developer. There's a few of us in our department here at Media Production. Um, my work for the past 20-some years has been focused mainly around uh, sound and some of the audio-video post-production, so I'm a, I'm a very much a computer kind of guy, and I spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, projects I've worked on, of course, that's how I've gotten to know you lovely folks in the music department is uh, lots of recordings with the Greystone Singers and uh, Wind Orchestra and the Jazz Ensemble and, and individual student uh, things that we've done, which have been super fun. Um, so I've gotten to do uh, a lot of really great uh, creative things with, uh, with your department in particular and people all over campus. Right, well, we um, have uh, we've held a few episodes already. The first one was tools for remote instruction. The second one was on microphones and what type of microphones we should be using, how to get the best sound from them, and some techniques and, and tips and tricks that you shared with us. And now today we're going to be talking about video recording. And so that, of course, is an important part of this whole aspect of being you know, perhaps in remote uh, teaching and learning. So for, to start us off, I just want to ask you, Wayne, like how important is it to plan our video? So if I want to do, I know I want to do a video, what's involved in planning of the video and how important is that? Well, and, and that is, uh, that's the starting point of any video. And we do, we do lots of seminars for people uh, on, on campus and off campus on how to maximize the, the process of making a video and that's the first place to start and quite often the place that a lot of people don't start. They get an idea and they grab their their camera and they just start recording a lot of video and they think they're going to make a story out of it later and there's the odd circumstance where that's kind of the necessary way to do it but you should always have some kind of a plan, some kind of a roadmap and it can be something as simple as just jotting down uh, a list of things you want to see and just sort of thinking about those things before you start recording them and that can actually help you plan where you're going to record your video so that's uh, a very important step and you can you can go as far as writing a complete script if you have actors that are going to be uh, dramatizing something you're going to need a script and they're going to need to follow that even if they go off script they've got to have some place to start. So your, your script and your planning are very important. It doesn't have to be in great detail, but you should at least have an idea of where the beginning, middle, and end of your uh, video are going to go before you grab your camera and start doing it. And you'll save yourself so much time and uh, frustration during the process afterwards. It'll make it a lot easier. Well, that makes sense too, right? It's sort of like you want to create a storyboard or an arc for, exactly. for your video. Mm -hmm. um, now, if this was about 30 years ago, um, and I asked you this question, I imagine that the answer, you know, would be this massive camcorder that you held uh, on your shoulder, and most often people would forget to take off the lens cap, and so their videos would be completely black. But we don't really have those kind of camcorders anymore. But I will ask you, what would you recommend people use as their video camera today? And the, the obvious answer, I, and I, the one we give just about anybody is, uh, while there are options like, say, your DSLR camera, which can give you stunning video images, uh, but they're very hard to use, the simplest thing is almost everybody has a video camera already that can do a great job, and it's your cell phone. And, and, and that's the, the smartphone camera is definitely the way to go, I think. Um, they're used in professional applications in some instances because they can do such a good job. Uh, they're very easy to set up and operate. You can use the built-in camera software. You can buy third-party camera apps that give you the same level of control you get on a high-end professional camera. You can, you know, adjust your exposure and your frame rates and your and all this stuff. And uh, you can really go in depth, or you can just keep it simple and use the built-in app and, and record. And there's just a couple of things to uh, to keep an eye on. But the cell phone's the way to go. 
Well, and I recall you using a cell phone, just your regular cell phone, to do a recording session um, for the Greystone Singers. Um, and you had like this cool little tripod and you were able to prevent it from um, kind of shaking mm -hmm. or, or trembling uh, with, with the picture. What exactly were you using that made that such a, a, a great shot? Well, the thing I was using there belongs to a coworker of mine because we all do this sort of thing for a living. So when a new toy comes out, sometimes we're too tempted and we have to buy one. Uh, and, and so my friend Peter uh, picked up this thing. A lot of people will call it a gimbal or a steady cam. Uh, it's made by a company called Moza. There's a few other varieties out there. They're available on Amazon and a few stores. And what it does is it stabilizes your camera electronically. So when you clip your phone into it, it senses your phone's movement and it reduces the shake and the movement and uh, you can control pan and tilt and that sort of thing. It, uh, it functions as a remote control, but it's really just a, a baby unit of what a lot of professionals have used for years now with film cameras and, and large video cameras. And you would see if you ever saw behind the scenes on a movie set, you'd see a guy who was, his title would be Steadicam Operator and you'd have this giant mechanism bolted to his body with all sorts of arms and stuff on it and a camera mounted to it and he'd operate it. And so this is just the modern day little tiny version that works with your cell phone. And it's just one of many accessories that people can pick up to sort of, you know, boost the quality of their video. Handheld video often doesn't look very good. It'll be crooked. I have a bad habit of doing that every time I hold a camera. I'm always tilted one way. Um, so these things compensate for that. Um, you can do a simpler version of that thing and we tell a lot of people about this. If, if you go to the dollar store and you get a selfie stick, it'll come with the adapter to put your phone on the top of it, of course, and, and it's a little tripod adapter. But if you extend that selfie stick out and maybe even, you know, tape some weight to the bottom of it, and when you're recording, just hold, hold it right underneath uh, where, it atta where your camera attaches to it. That has a similar effect to those um, stabilizers that you pay all this money for. And it, and it won't be nearly as good, but it gives you just that little bit of extra stability. So you can, there's all, all those little life hacks that, uh, that you can use uh, that really help things out quite a bit. Okay, that's great. That being said, what settings should people use when recording video? To set up your camera on your phone it's there aren't a lot of things to do and the automatic mode can work for you um, one of the things I always tell people to do because some people will try to save space and they'll reduce the resolution of the video or the images that are being recorded I always although it takes up a little more space I always set the phone for maximum quality so if you've got a, f a camera that shoots 4k video shoot 4k 1080p is the next step down uh, some video applications in your phone will actually let you set how much space that video image takes up. It's called a data rate. You can turn that up or down for better or less quality. Yeah, the built-in applications generally don't do that. So I always say 4K if you can. Um, things like uh, when you're in your phone and you're setting up a shot, what you'll notice sometimes is when the lighting changes a little bit, if you move your phone around, it's always compensating and trying to get you the best light you possibly can get but what will happen to your image then is you'll see it flickering and going back and forth so you can do things like locking the exposure and sometimes that's just a simple matter of holding pressing on the screen and pushing and holding on it and it'll sort of lock the focus and the exposure to say if I was recording you in your living room and it'll lock it on your face and then if I happen to move the camera a little bit and it senses the bright window it won't turn down the exposure. It'll leave it the same so your face stays exposed and focused the way it should be. And if the rest of the image changes, you want to make sure that the, the focus of your image is always consistent that way. So those are two really important settings to look at. Okay. That's really, that's really interesting. And I'm glad you mentioned that if you, you know, were recording me in my living room, which is <laughs> where you see me right now, <laughs> where a lot right of now. us are. <laughs> So um, we talked about sound last in the last episode mm -hmm. and using microphones, but when we're doing video recording, what can people do to get the best sound when recording? Video recording on phones has advanced so much and we, like I said, we've got 4K video on phones now and stuff and the image quality we're getting is spectacular really if you think about it. Um, where they tend to fail quite often is when you're recording sound. The microphones that are built in are slowly getting a little better and, and camera manufacturers and phone manufacturers are paying a little more attention. Um, they can do a pretty good job from close distance so that's usually the first thing I do is if you want good sound, if you can get as close to your subject as possible, um, use that proximity to get a good quality sound. Sometimes 
what we've done, and a lot of people will, can do this because they've got a second device lying around. You've upgraded your phone, you kept your old one, it's sitting in the drawer. What you can actually do is use the voice recorder in the second device. And uh, again, if I was recording you and I wanted to have my phone further away, I could set phone number two just on audio and set it in front of you. You wouldn't see it. It's still only a foot or two away and have that record the sound while my main camera phone records the video and later on when you edit you can line those two things up and so you can get the good sound recorded close and the camera further away. Beyond that you have to go out and buy a microphone and you can spend anywhere from you know probably fifteen or twenty dollars to you know hundreds of dollars on a microphone that attaches to your phone or any other camera to get better sound and it uh, it'll help quite a bit if you're recording interviews um, they make microphones that are what they call a lavalier mic and it just clips on you'll see people on TV wearing them all the time they do a really good job of if you don't mind seeing the microphone of a person talking if you're interviewing them and they can you can get wireless versions you can get ones that plug right into your phone uh, Amazon of course is a great place to at least research this stuff even if you don't uh, plan on buying from there but it, there's plenty of there to look at and choose from and you can sort of get an idea of what's available there but this, the, the add-on microphone is probably an accessory that is important if sound is really important to you. And for musicians, sound is usually really important yeah. to us, yes. <laughs> so that was uh, talking about sound and what, um, what we can do to get the best sound when recording. But are there any accessories that will help videos look better? I think one of the things that probably will help the most if you want to buy an accessory for your phone for video is uh, a light, uh, some sort of a light source. And, and I talked a little earlier about controlling light and that sort of thing. And you don't always have the option to uh, light a room properly. Um, depending on how close or far you are, you can spend an awful lot of money on, on lights. Uh, you can buy little tiny lights that will attach to your phone and, and they'll do a nice job as long as you're, again, close enough to your subject. Um, so as a, as a video accessory, that's probably the best thing you can do is try and add some sort of a light source to your phone just to improve things a little bit. And it maybe it doesn't attach to your phone, maybe it sits beside it. Um, other than that, a, an accessory for your phone that isn't a physical thing uh, is what I mentioned earlier is one of those third-party camera apps. So you can buy an app for your phone that records video. I use Movie Pro. There's a couple of different ones out there and they give you just that extra level of control over what your video is doing and, and manual controls like you'd have on a really fancy camera. So they can be a lot of fun to play with. They can also step up the amount of work you have to put into getting everything set right, but if you want to spend the time playing around, they're a lot of fun. And they're not very expensive either. So Wayne, when we worked together on the virtual choir projects, and I had to give some instructions to the singers on how to best record themselves. You were very helpful in describing how to, um, to set up the camera in terms of portrait or landscape and, and those sorts of things. So can you describe for us now some basic video techniques for recording videos? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, that's the, one of the first places to start, and, and it's, a, it's a hot topic of conversation, uh, and people have made, you know, joke videos about vertical video syndrome, because the habit that people form is when they go to take a picture, and it's fine when it's uh, going to be just a photograph, and you'll put your phone in portrait mode, and you'll hold it up and snap the picture. But when you record, record video that way, right now, most of us watch video on a screen that is 16 by 9 this way. Even if it's on your computer, your screen is horizontally oriented. So if your video is flipped the other way, what you end up with is a lot of empty space that you get, don't get to take advantage of. Um, so that now that being said, I think there's a company out there that's making a TV that automatically orients itself to vertical if you have vertical video. But we won't go there. <laughs> um, so uh, shoot in, in a horizontal mode, in landscape mode as we call it. Uh, the other thing is uh, pay attention to uh, simple photographic uh, techniques like the rule of thirds where you divide your screen into three horizontally, uh, three vertically, and if you put the focus of your subject on the intersections of those lines, it looks more pleasing to the eye. I think it frames it nicely. It just looks prettier. So that's, that's one of the things when you're recording someone uh, in a lit room with a, and in your case, I can see it now too, you've got windows behind you. Um, there's, you're actually quite well lit, so it looks pretty good, but uh, again, your, your video settings are such that you see the windows are sort of blown out behind you. Some cameras will try to compensate for the light levels and they'll set the light level for your windows and you'll turn into this dark silhouette. So you want to try to avoid uh, people that are what we call backlit or heavily backlit. Don't shoot against a window, shoot against a solid 
background or something that is uh, darker than the subject at least, it makes it a lot easier to get uh, proper settings on the camera. Things like lighting, you can do very simple things. If you don't have an extra fancy video light to add to your camera, what I'm doing in this office right now, because I had overhead lights that were um, quite um, bright and, and uh, as I am follically challenged, it bounces a lot of light off the top of my head. So I've set up uh, a lamp. And uh, things like a simple uh, table lamp with a shade on it provide that sort of softer extra light that can sort of light up the side of someone's face and, and uh, give you just a little, little better quality image. Shadows are fine, they can be very dramatic, but you want to uh, use your eyes to make sure that your, everything in your picture is looking like it should. That's great. And, and Wayne, they do have TV stage makeup for um, eliminating shine on, <laughs> on faces and heads. So that's something to, uh, to consider. <laughs> I should find some of that. I think we actually have some of that around here because, of course, we you know, shoot a lot of people that uh, do have uh, uh, shiny heads. Yes, and, and I know you do say shoot a, shoot people a lot, um, <laughs> <laughs> just about just a habit. It is. Well, and I should mention that it's about four o'clock here, so um, and the sun is uh, is setting on the the west side. So if this was mm -hmm. later, uh, it might not work. But I do have a sconce above me that you can't see right here, yeah. and and a light as well. So yeah. lighting is is critical for yeah, shooting. I can a video. I can tell That's there's a, like sure. a nice a nice glow bouncing off your face. I, I had a feeling there was another light in front of you there somewhere that was providing that nice warm sort of tone. Yeah, yeah. And I that's just, it came with the house. So it's not like <laughs> something I went, <laughs> I went out to buy. Oh, dear. Um, so, all right. So we have an understanding now of how to get the best sound and the best video techniques for when we're um, uh, filming a video. Mm -hmm. So what... Uh, or shall I say, how much space does this video file take up on our device? Because we don't all have like, you know, unlimited memories mm -hmm. in our in our phones. So what what kind of space are we looking at for taking up on our device? Well, and I'll put this in general terms. Um, most phones probably have at least about a 32 gigabyte storage capacity. Um, depending on how many apps and other things you have on there, most of that could be taken up. But really, you can put uh, probably an hour's worth of video in 10 gigabytes of space on your phone. So you can shoot an awful lot. They don't take up a lot of space, even at a 4K quality. Uh, I can speak about Apple devices more than Android phones. Um, the way Apple has changed the video encoding on their phones now, they're using what's called a high efficiency video codec. And it really can cram an awful lot of really good quality video into a fairly small space. The thing that I would probably recommend is before you go out to uh, look at your phone and look at what's on it and just clear some space because some people run their devices at, you know, at capacity. They have every picture they've taken for the last 10 years on their device or something like that. So you want to maybe back that stuff up and just create some space. Give yourself, you know, 10 gigabytes or so of space and uh, try to offload that video when you get a chance to a computer and store it somewhere, which is just a good idea anyway because you want to keep a backup in case someone steals your phone or you... Uh, damage your phone and everything gets wrecked, drop it in the lake or something. <laughs> so, okay, so we've taken our video. Now, do, how do we edit it? Can we edit it right on our phone? Do we have to transport it or transfer it to a computer and edit it there? How do we go about this post-production process of, our, of editing our videos? You can edit video on your phone and there's, again, talking about Apple products, you can get iMovie, the Apple's sort of standard consumer video editing software for your phone or your iPad uh, and, and and you can do a pretty good job of editing. The only thing I find with editing on the phone is that you know if my phone is small and my fingers are fat and I have a little trouble maneuvering <laughs> in the software and, and the iPad version of iMovie actually works quite well so you can use that. Uh, the step beyond that is to send your video to a personal computer like a laptop or, or a desktop and use one of the many programs that are out there. Some people use Adobe products um, iMovie again is available for Macintosh computers, Final Cut Pro 10 is available if you want to spend some money. Uh, the one program we recommend to lots of people because it works on Windows or Mac and is actually a fantastic program that is free is called DaVinci Resolve and I'll post the link again in the, in the comment section on the, on the video. Uh, I love it, I've been playing around with it quite a bit. I have others that I like more but for free I don't think I've seen anything that beats it. There's a lot of offerings out there that I did some research on that appear to be free and then 
when you go to use them, there's limitations and they want you to pay if you really want to use them to their full extent. But uh, DaVinci Resolve is one of those programs that is created again by a company that mainly makes video hardware. So the software is just something they give away as a little bonus for people so that they can uh, edit their video. And you can also pay for a version of that that does even more than the free version does if you really want to get into the professional level. Yeah, and I like that you said that you can play around uh, within the programs because I think that's honestly the best way we can really learn uh, about how to use something and sure. and put something in there that you can afford to lose. So maybe mm -hmm. it's a backup of, of a video or yeah. something, but and then and then just go and play around and yeah. find the tools and trial and error is mm -hmm. honestly the best way we we right we tend to get comfortable yeah. using yeah. Um, using a program. And but I know, Wayne, you have made yourself uh, accessible if people do have some questions about For anything sure. yeah. to put in the comments on yeah. the YouTube channel and then you'll um, you'll address them as yeah. fast as best you answer. can. And so yeah, we really appreciate you uh, doing that because you have a lot of expertise in all of these programs. Well, for sure. And I'm, like I was going to say, you, you beat me to the okay. punch. I was going to say I'd answer them as fast as I can, as soon as I can get around to them, you know. Um, the one thing I was going to say about these video editing programs that's really great is when you talk about, you know, playing around, all of these editors are not what are called non-destructive editors. So when you move these clips around and cut and slice and dice them, the original video clip is always still there somewhere. You can always get it back. So play away and experiment and do crazy things and you learn stuff along the way. And you, if you, things get too messed up, you can just start over again. Yeah, that's what's great about the undo button, right? That's, Absolutely. <laughs> that's, a, that's a saving grace for so yeah, many of us. For sure. <laughs> so then once we've edited our video, how do we go about sharing it? Because sometimes those files are really large. Mm -hmm. And then we need to figure out a, a cloud system or a WeTransfer or yeah. Dropbox. How do you, how do you suggest um, uh, sharing the videos? What's the best way to do that? One of the ways I think is a really good way to share uh, your videos, and I have friends who have used this method to uh, back up their family videos and stuff because you can make them unviewable by other people, is just to use a simple thing like YouTube. And you can edit them, you can upload them to YouTube, you can make them private or unlisted so people can't just randomly find them on YouTube. And you can still share those videos with your friends or whoever you want to. And YouTube does a pretty good job of maintaining the quality. So that was one of the things I was going to say is if you're going to, export the video before you upload it, export it at a really high quality as well because YouTube is still going to reprocess that video and it may reduce it in quality a bit. So if you send them a lesser quality, you'll get even lesser quality than that by the time they're done with it. So you can send a big file, then do that as much as you can. Um, and like I said, it's, a, it's almost like having a cloud backup because until YouTube decides to shut down their services, those videos will always be there. And there's things like Vimeo, which have limitations. It's like YouTube for professionals, and they really want you to pay. Um, and then, of course, WeTransfer is uh, um, quite convenient. Dropbox has become extremely popular and, and already was before COVID-19 swept the world, but now it's even more important because people are using these cloud services like crazy. For people on the U of S campus, uh, which, you know, is be a limited part of our audience, but we all get, any every employee and faculty member gets uh, a whole terabyte of storage through uh, university's uh, OneDrive system. So it's a lot of storage. We, we've made great use of that because video files are huge and we move a lot of big data around. So we've uh, made a lot of good use of that. And so that's something if you are on campus to really take advantage of because it's a great way to share. And OneDrive, uh, we, I have found anyway, is quite fast in its transfers. Not as fast as copying a file to a hard drive, but as far as transferring stuff over the internet goes, I find its speed is quite good as long as you have a good internet connection yourself. So that's a good option too. Yeah, that's how we share a lot of files and it's Absolutely. very easy to upload and yeah. share and just type in your email address and then you get the link. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, that's been very, very helpful. I, I do want to say that if you are uploading to YouTube or something, make sure you have enough time uh, or account for the time that it takes mm -hmm. for you to upload because it does take a little bit depending yeah. on the size of the file, that's for, for sure. sure. So I did mention at some point earlier in this episode, um, our work with virtual choirs. And so that is a nice sort of uh, preamble 
to discussing our next episode, which is looking behind the scenes at how to do a virtual choir. And so mm -hmm. you and I have had a little bit of, of practice in that. And um, you certainly uh, need a, an expert in the post-production realm to help you with that. It's not a matter of, uh, of kind of a, a conductor just conducting. It's, it's actually more involved in the preparation mm -hmm. of the files and then the post-production of the files uh, that really make a virtual choir uh, something special. So sure. we're going to be discussing um, the, the background and, and the setup to, mm -hmm. uh, to making a virtual choir in our next episode. And again, if anyone has any questions about anything we've done, tools for remote instruction, microphones, video recording, um, please do send an email to Wayne or myself and you can mm -hmm. find us um, in the university directory for our emails. And then as I said, Wayne will uh, respond to questions in the comment section of the YouTube channel. So we look forward to chatting with Wayne again next week mm -hmm. for uh, a look, look behind the scenes at making a virtual choir. So thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you, Jen.